Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome to episode seven of Catching Carbon and I am here with Jeff Holyoke and special guest Paul Gross of Remora. Paul is the co-founder and co-CEO. We are absolutely excited to have a trailblazer uh, in the capture industry joining us today. Paul, thanks for much, so much for jumping on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, so uh, real quick background on Remora and you can give it way better than I can, but Remora is capturing the tailpipe exhaust off of semi-trucks. And, uh, and then re reintroducing and commercializing that CO2 back into the market. It's a, it's a fascinating technology. Uh, Paul, give us a quick background of kind of your company and what you're working on and, and you know, how you kind of uh, developed into all of this. And then and we're gonna kind of transition to that to talk about you know, the capturing at the source like a, uh, as opposed to direct air capture that we've been hearing about. And, and ultimately, you know, how does 45Q and, and the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, how has that impacted your business, if at all, and has it changed anything about what you're doing? So, so great to have you. Thanks for having us from uh, New Haven, Connecticut there. And uh, tell us all about it. Sure. So Remora builds a device that captures the carbon emissions from the tailpipe of a semi-truck. As you mentioned, our system retrofits onto existing diesel trucks. We capture about 80% of the truck's carbon emissions. And then we sell that captured carbon dioxide to concrete producers or other end users. Eventually, we'll pump the CO2 into EPA certified wells underground. Either way, storing it permanently, and then we're sharing the revenue that we generate back with the owner of the fleet. So the device actually pays for itself over its lifetime. And then we're able to help big fleets dramatically reduce their carbon emissions and meet their climate commitments. So that is the core concept. And then to answer the second part of your question about where Remora is coming from, uh, this originated in my co-founder, Christina's PhD, coming out of the University of Michigan. She got funded by the EPA to investigate whether mobile carbon capture would even be possible. She spent a whole bunch of years bench testing, vehicle testing, ultimately testing in the EPA's National Vehicle and Fuel Emissions Lab. And when that testing was successful, um, she and I teamed up to start the company along with my co-founder, Eric, who is this totally brilliant mechanical engineer who built electric and hydrogen semi-trucks and buses and all kinds of crazy first-generation automotive technologies before this. And so the three of us started the company. And just a year and a half later, you know, we've signed up a whole bunch of big customers. The team's grown to about 50 people. Um, and we're, you know, we're moving quickly. Yeah, that's incredible growth. Uh, you know, I, I'm aware you guys are Y Combinator backed, which is which is very cool. And and you've you know, recently uh, led a seed round. Uh, the growth, a year and a half, 50 employees. What does that look like? You know, scaling this up, and you know, I'm sure there's plenty of room to go. Yeah. So as you mentioned, we we went through Y Combinator. We raised the seed round from some of the you know some of the most incredible investors there are. You know, we feel really lucky to be working with. Lower Carbon Capital, which is Chris Saka's fund, as well as Union Square Ventures, First Round, um, Voyager, and some other great partners. Um, and yeah, as you say, we've we've grown the team a lot. Uh, we've now signed up a whole bunch of big customers, including a bunch of Fortune 500 companies. Um, we're working with folks like Ryder and Cargill, um, and you know we're we're really excited to be getting our first pilots on the road in the next six months. Yeah, so I've got uh, kind of two-part question a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I'm not an advocate for or believer that electric trucks are really going to become something that, that really works uh, just from the battery size and, and capacities and, and range and things like that. However, hydrogen fuel cells and Nikola, what they're doing out there, I believe there's a lot of traction that's going to happen over that. A, how, does that, how do you see that impacting your business? I think you've even called it kind of a bridge technology. I mean, sooner or later, we are not going to have diesel trucks with exhaust, uh, but that's years, decades away before that goes. Uh, the second one that just kind of recently came to my mind in all of this, um, does this have a similar application in rail, in locomotives? Uh, obviously, there's a huge amount of diesel exhaust that are coming off of that. Could we be doing the same thing there one day? Yeah. So I think we really need an all of the above approach to decarbonization. There are so many vehicles on the road. There's so many different sources of carbon emissions that no one solution is going to be this perfect silver bullet. We shouldn't you know, put our, all of our eggs in one basket because we need solutions really quickly. This is a crisis that we're in. The problem is happening right now. So we can't wait decades for a slow transition. 
our view in particular on electric and hydrogen trucks comes from my co-founders. Uh, Christina actually invented the EPA's advanced testing program for electric vehicles while she was there. Eric built hydrogen and electric trucks before this. Um, you know, I think, as you say, on electric trucks, one of the challenges is batteries are really big and heavy. So it's very hard to electrify long haul heavy duty routes because you end up taking up half your payload capacity with batteries. Not to mention then, of course, all the grid upgrades and big charging stations um, that are required. I think the challenge with hydrogen is that green hydrogen is still really expensive. You know, 99% of the world's hydrogen currently comes from steam methane reforming, which is incredibly carbon intensive. Um, so we need to scale up green hydrogen production and get that down to cost parity with diesel. Uh, then we need to figure out a way to distribute it around the world, um, roll out hydrogen trucks everywhere, get refueling stations set up. And I think that's going to take, as you say, decades um, to, to come to fruition. I think the positive case I'd make for our technology in the longer run is, you know, we, we definitely don't want trucks to keep running on diesel. But if you run trucks on a biofuel or renewable diesel and then capture those carbon emissions, the truck is actually carbon negative. So every mile that you drive, you're removing carbon dioxide from the air. And to us, that's maybe the most exciting way to decarbonize. Then we're not just getting to carbon neutral. We're actually removing CO2 for every package that we ship or, you know, every time we move something from one part of the U.S. to another. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And, you know, we commend you for um, tackling, like as Jeff had mentioned, uh, something that needs to be addressed now. We're, we're looking to see how can we start pushing solutions in the near term. And, and Remora is doing just that. And, and as you alluded to, you know, capturing at the source versus direct air capture. So, um, you know, I guess it was just the, the perfect storm of the three of you coming together. Uh, but but why are, why are you starting with uh, semi trucks? And, and, you know, what Jeff is saying is, it's more tangible with this hub and spoke model where you have a fleet of trucks on the road that are coming back to a centralized hub or, or have off tape hubs to take the uh, CO2 that's being captured and store it so you can use it for commercial use or you can use it uh, to be sequestered uh, as opposed to you know, having to go location to location and pick up. But, but I guess you know understanding why was the decision made on, on trucks, like Jeff said, is there more we can do? And, and also, you know, do you believe that there is still a play for direct air capture as well? Is that, is that something we should be pursuing? With the Anti-Inflation Act, um, you know, we do believe we're gonna see more technology coming to the space. Paul, you're a first mover, which is fantastic, but just want your feedback on that from the source capture versus direct air capture uh, and, and, and what you kind of think. For sure. So to take the first part of your question first, you know, we are focused on semi trucks initially because, as you say, it's, you know, it's the right balance. We don't want to start by developing just this massive technology that takes years. It's really hard to prototype. You know, semi trucks aren't too big. It's easy. We have our own semi trucks. We can try stuff out relatively quickly. At the same time, semi trucks, as we already talked about, are very, very hard to electrify. So we really want to make sure that our technology remains complementary to electrification. You know, we don't think that this is needed for passenger vehicles, for example, which are already successfully going electric. Uh, so we, we wanted to focus on a segment that was going to be really hard to decarbonize. In the future, we absolutely could scale up our technology to locomotives or to cargo ships or to other bigger sources of diesel emissions. I think we'll always be focused on those large scale, heavy duty, hard to decarbonize types of vehicles that are basically moving a big load a long distance. So that's the perspective sort of on, on what areas uh, mobile carbon capture might be helpful. In terms of direct air capture, um, again, I think we need an all of the above approach to solving this problem. I, I think everyone should be trying different things and I really want us to have a diversified portfolio of decarbonization solutions. I think direct air capture has a really important place uh, to play in terms of the you know, emissions that are going to be hardest to get rid of in any other way. You know, there are unfortunately going to be just some emissions that are very, very difficult to reduce or eliminate. And in that case, we are going to need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We also need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to get to pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So in those ways, I think direct air capture is an important piece of the puzzle. And like you say, Inflation Reduction Act is going to help move that along more quickly. 
Yeah, so so stick on the IRA there, um, or the Anti-Inflation Act, as as Luke likes to call it. Um, yeah, that's my favorite. Or, yeah, right. We're renaming Watch Acts back. now. It's, a, it's fine. <laughs> but uh, no, so st- stick on that a little bit, and and I, I kind of correlate. So we talked about it previously on on a previous episode. But for direct air capture, I think it's one hundred eighty dollars a ton now that you capture, which maybe subsidizes some of their cost. Uh, you know, most of those run four or five hundred dollars a ton to capture the CO two. So obviously the upside down. But I kind of equate it to kind of Formula One racing or a runway model fashion show, like those type of things. We don't actually commercialize the technology that's being done in there, but we learn a whole lot that then can be applied. Um, is, is some of the uh, the IRA funding and and uh, uh, tax breaks and things like that are they helping you at all and helping Romora? Uh, as far as, you know, helping develop some of the technology in the IP? Absolutely. The Inflation Reduction Act is really incredible for Remora. Um, You know, not only did the Inflation Reduction Act increase the 45Q tax credit, which is the tax credit that, you know, incentivizes companies like us to sequester carbon dioxide permanently in EPA certified wells. So it increased the value of the credit, but it also did a bunch of other kind of uh, tweaks to the 45Q credit that makes it easier for a startup to claim that credit. You know, so it allowed the tax credit to be direct pay from the IRS. It reduced the minimum threshold to qualify for the tax credit. Those are also really important tweaks that I want to mention just in addition to the price increase. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's take it back to Remora really quick. Uh, you know, from from your standpoint, what have been your biggest obstacles uh, to kind of go? Uh, you said a year and a half, two years. You've grown dramatically, raised funds. What what are, you, what are your challenges? Is it you know? It sounds like you got the technology, but is it is it scale? Is it adoption? You know, you got some good customers doing pilots. What is, what's the biggest challenges you've faced in the market so far? Yeah. I mean, footprint retrofitting to yeah. semi. Just thinking about that. You know, um, it sounds like such a challenge to overcome but clearly you guys have done it quickly would, would love to understand that and and you know really see what are the obstacles that you have overcome and that you're going to continue to overcome or are working towards yeah definitely retrofitting trucks is is no easy business but the good news is that there are existing aftermarket bolt holes on semi trucks that are ready for retrofits of technologies like this. So, you know, trucks have all sorts of things bolted to the back, whether it's an auxiliary power unit or a toolkit. And, you know, we're just using some of that same uh, space and some of those same bolt holes to basically retrofit onto the frame rails. So, you know, that's the way that we solve that. We're just following the bodybuilder guidelines from the vehicle manufacturers. So we're not doing anything that they don't recommend. I think the hardest problem for us is gonna be scaling up manufacturing and figuring out our supply chain, you know, there is a crazy amount of demand for this technology. There is an exponentially growing number of companies that are committing to reduce their carbon emissions. They have these huge fleets of semi-trucks, which are often their largest sector of emissions, and they have no good solution right now to reduce those emissions. So we have gotten an enormous amount of inbound from companies that want to use this technology. We're sold out for this year, almost sold out for next year. And that's a great problem to have, but it means that we really need to scale up our manufacturing quickly. We just moved into a new 70,000 square foot facility in Detroit where we're building out our first assembly line. And we have a fantastic team working on this problem. But as you know, in today's world, it's very, very difficult to manufacture big pieces of equipment. Um, you know, it's very difficult to get all the supplies in one place. And, um, you know, it's also difficult to hire the folks that are going to be helping to assemble the system. So that's, I think, going to be our biggest challenge as we try to scale quickly. Yeah, going going from, from pilot and beta to full scale production, especially in a year and a half and hiring, that's, that's great, though. Well... Yeah, I got to say, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of your technology and what you guys are doing, um, but not just from the carbon capture, uh, but really from the CO2 side. I mean, you know, we're big advocates of, you know, we believe that the distribution model of CO2 ultimately is going to change dramatically in the next five to 10 years. And our current sources of CO2 will go away, That, but we have tremendous amounts of CO2. Let's identify other uses, other sources and, and constructive uses of that CO2. And, and you're doing that. So as you start to build these hubs, I feel like we're going to have 
more more uh, regional supplies of CO2 where it's needed, uh, uh, as well as taking it out of the air where it's being generated. So huge advocates of that is uh, the entire business model of you know, kind of what we look and see is going on in the market as well. Yeah, and I want to piggyback on that. So Paul, when you first you know came together with your co-founders and had this idea, I mean, was the initial thought we are going to sequester all of this CO2, right? And now you're in the space and you see that there is an absolute demand shortages we talk about a lot on this podcast. Has the model kind of changed to include alternative use? Has that always been the end goal? Because uh, you really are solving multiple problems by having the ability to both sequester and use this CO2 where it is needed in critical applications. Yeah, the plan was always to do both because we think it's really important to use CO2 in a circular solution as much as possible. And there are a lot of fantastic companies already out there utilizing large quantities of CO2 for all kinds of essential products. And there are a lot of great new companies getting started that are gonna utilize CO2 for a bunch of other products like fuels or concrete or plastics. And we wanna make sure that we're able to supply all of those folks. Our customers really want their CO2 to be utilized in a circular solution as much as possible. You know, a lot of our customers are themselves developing ways to make their products out of CO2. So one day they could generate the CO2 that then makes their products. Um, so I think we, we really wanna do both. Cer you know, sequestration in an EPA certified well is also a fantastic way to, to sequester carbon dioxide. Uh, but we just, we wanna make sure that we have a diversified portfolio. And as we talk to CO2 users and hear about the intense pain that they're feeling from the current shortage and the many shortages we've seen in recent years, I think we just, we know we can provide a much more reliable source of CO2 uh, because trucks run year in, year out. They're very reliable, they're very predictable. They don't just suddenly shut down like an ethanol plant might. Um, so it's, you know, it's really important for us to step in and, and we want to try to play that reliable role for the industry. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and that's what this podcast has been all about is, is just getting messaging out there, helping people understand that there are positive uses and um, you know being an outlet of information. So Paul, to have someone like you uh, with your knowledge coming on and, and sharing your story with us, we are absolute fans, excited to see what Ramora is going to be doing. Thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Any Absolutely. closing thoughts? No, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put a link to your website in, uh, in the show notes. Uh, everybody go check out what these guys are doing. Fascinating technology. Follow along with, with, the, with their journey through all of this because uh, I think it's uh, definitely going to be a big part of our future in CO2. Yeah. Paul Gross, Paul. co-founder of Mara. Thank you so much. Appreciate we'll be catching it, up with you soon. Everyone take care. Thank you so much for having me.